complicated. This is really a, a group project. So just to call it something, we, we, we got the website euronomics.com. We needed a hyphen because euronomics.com was 7,500 euro. Whereas uh, Euro hyphenomics was, was basically nothing. Uh, so we have a mix of, uh, of people involved. Um, everyone is uh, European, even if they're exiled in New York City or New Jersey. Um, and everyone in this group, you know, it's a mix of finance professors and macroeconomics professors. Because clearly the European crisis has both the macro and the financial market dimensions. Uh, but I think it's fair to say everyone here is uh, quite involved in, in their own national um, uh, economic debate, whether it's in uh, Germany with Marcus Brennemeyer, uh, Luis Garricano and Thanos Santos are you know, quite prominent in the Spanish debate, um, Marco Pagano in Italy, Ricardo Reis is uh, Portuguese and you know, he's very involved there. A lot of them write in national newspapers every week, that kind of thing. David Sesmar is on the uh, Council of Economic Advisors in Paris. Stein van Neuburg is a Belgian, and they have their own debt problems. He has no government to talk to him about them, but uh, uh, they, they still have to think about these things. And Dimitri Vianos is, is, is Greek, and he's at the LSE. So uh, overall, we, we essentially are writing a book about the European crisis, about where it came from, uh, what it is, and uh, most importantly, probably, what the future of Europe should look like. And so we're, we're writing on what the future fiscal arrangements for Europe should look like, uh, the future European banking system, uh, and also the future of the sovereign debt market. And, and, you know, all of these interact. And so what I'm going to talk about today about the European safe bond idea is mostly about how to get the sovereign debt market to work better in the context of a monetary union. Um, you know, the other name for this group really should be, should be euroskype.com uh, because uh, with Skype, uh, group calling, you know, we, we have like six or seven hour long uh, group conversations uh, and, uh, you know, without Skype it's hard to see how this kind of group, which is dispersed, uh, could work. I should also say, uh, again, going back to the European infrastructure, but Marcus Brunemeyer and Marco Pagano are on the European Systemic Risk Board uh, Council of Academic Advisors. So, you know, uh, through various channels, uh, what we're talking about here gets fed into uh, European level <coughs> and national level uh, discussions. So it's, it's an interesting process. So really, um, you know, clearly you can spend a lot of time on the day by day, you know, how should we think about the crisis on any particular day? But the, the you know, the solution to the crisis in the end is, um, you know, we're not, I'm not gonna talk here about the disintegration of Europe. Uh, more the uh, focus here is what the new Europe should look like. And so, you know, what we think the long run should look like. Uh, you know, we, we think there should be essentially a European banking system of which the European safe bond idea is just one element. Uh, there needs to be a European uh, resolution regime, so the equivalent of the FDIC for Europe, so that there's a European... Uh, uh, authority that can go in and close down uh, banks safely or force recapitalization, et cetera. Um, on fiscal, clearly there needs to be a lot more uh, you know, monitoring and surveillance of national fiscal policies. But as a group, we, we don't particularly uh, think a, a common treasury, such as the uh, Soros letter this week. You know, that, that's one way to go, but we don't think it's necessary. Um, so, you know, what is necessary is sufficient fiscal coordination to, to provide banking stability. Because if you have a stable banking system, then diversity in fiscal policy within limits is, is quite possible. Um, so I think that's an important message is this idea that the only way to have a monetary union is to have like a high level fiscal union is, it, you know, it, it's, not, it's not necessary. Um, you need more than what we have, but full scale, um, not necessary. Uh, there's obviously transition issues about how you get from today towards the new system, uh, and you can spend time talking about that. Uh, but what we want to talk about uh, is this uh, European safe bond idea. So the, the, you know, this is well known here in Ireland especially, but the rest of Europe is now learning this graph, uh, which is the interaction, the diabolical loop between uh, banking problems and sovereign debt problems. So, you know, the problem is, you know, if, if uh, banks are big holders of national bonds, clearly if sovereign risk goes up, 
then the banks become weaker. In turn, if the banks become weaker, risk of taxpayer costs, whether directly through bailouts or indirectly through all sorts of mechanisms, <coughs> such as a you know, credit squeeze, meaning slower economic growth and so on, there's a lot of loop, you know, feedback loops there. So, you know, one, only one dimension, but one dimension of that is the fact that banks dispropor disproportionately hold national sovereign debt. So you have a national loop here, uh, you know, Greek banks being overexposed to Greek debt and so on. And the problem inside a currency union, and this is, again, a lot of um, what you need to think about here is the division, the, 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 the gap between sovereign markets and, and the money market in a European context. So the world history of uh, financial crises is, you know, for every sovereign debt crisis, there's a local central bank who, who you know, can get involved in uh, resolving the situation. Whereas within Europe, within a single currency union, uh, you, can, you can run. You can run from the sovereign debt market and without currency risk. Because if you don't like Italian debt or Spanish debt, the German bond is right there for you. So you can run out of the local uh, sovereign debt market uh, without cost, without currency risk, and so on. Uh, and that, that provides a big source of volatility, which is unnecessary. Um, and so you know, the, the issue is, how do you cater towards the desire for safety, which is very important, uh, while at the same time stabilizing these sovereign debt markets? And it's important that there is a safe asset. So the, you know, right now in Europe, it's hard to find a safe asset. But for all sorts of modern finance, you do need a safe asset for collateral and transactions. I mean, if you think about how markets are organized, uh, having a safe asset is, is, is a fundamental characteristic. And uh, you know, the, the situation in Europe is historically, uh, until now, all of these sovereign debts were essentially treated as safe by regulators. So under the Basel uh, regulations, they didn't have a zero risk, risk rate for a local sovereign. Under ECB, the haircuts uh, are pretty low in terms of collateral treatment. And so uh, this meant that banks had a big incentive to, to hold sovereign debt. Uh, and there's all sorts of ways that you know, local governments might have provided incentives to especially hold uh, domestic sovereign debt. So uh, the, the European Safe Bond proposal is essentially a, a bit of financial engineering and a bit of regulatory change can, can weaken this uh, diabolical loop. Um, because essentially, if you can create a safe asset which uh, <coughs> pools across all the national sovereign bonds, uh, then this, this means that you know, the, uh, panics when there's a desire for safety can be accommodated without these big capital flows from one part of the monetary union to another part of the monetary union. So this is, not, this is only one issue. We're not saying uh, it's going to solve the crisis. You need the European resolution regime and so on. But in terms of stabilizing the debt market, this, could, this can help. So as I say, the, the, what's going on right now is uh, the flight to safety is a flight to Germany. And uh, that, that kind of creates cross-border capital flows, which can you know, amplify the, the, the problems in the national economies. Uh, and of course, we know, we know that holders of German debt have had a great crisis in the sense of you know, the value of German debt has been shooting up. And so many banks are saying, well, you know, okay, mark us down on what we own in Ger Greece, but mark us up on the fact that we now are sitting on German bonds, uh, which are now more valuable. So the, the, uh, this, this you know, uh, shuffling of portfolios within the European system um, is, is uh, generally destabilizing. So what, what we suggest is we suggest is that a European debt agency is formed. And the European debt agency is essentially a, a transformer. It's buying up to 60% of GDP of sovereign bonds. So, uh, and then it's issuing two types of debt. Uh, ESBs, which are super safe. So essentially, you need a lot of default before the ESBs lose value. And then you have a junior tranche. Uh, you know, so we're saying the first X percent of any default is absorbed by the holders of the junior debt. And by having that buffer there, then the uh, ESBs, the senior debt, are, will be perceived as much safer. 
Um, and so, so that, that is the, the core of what we think, <laughs> is that um, if, you, if you have that structure, is uh, that generates a truly safe European bond. Um, it's safe because of diversification, but mostly it's safe because of this uh, tranching, that you've got a first loss uh, junior bond before the ESVs would get hit. It's attractive because uh, there's no uh, common guarantee. There's no government here saying, we guarantee to repay the ESVs. So each national government is still on its own. So you get around any Eurobond issues about uh, joint and several guarantees of debt. The Eurobonds are big issues with moral hazard. I mean, we saw that in August. Once uh, there was some uh, deal being done in, uh, at a European level, we saw the Italian uh, Parliament backsliding pretty rapidly about their level of fiscal commitments. Um, and until uh, fiscal monitoring, surveillance, uh, cooperation is a lot further advanced, the idea of you know, uh, even you know, of other countries uh, guaranteeing the debt of uh, Italy and Greece in particular sounds a bit odd. So, so having, a, having a, a system which does not provide debt guarantees to countries which you don't really want to guarantee is, is, is a big uh, uh, benefit. And the reason we're saying is you can get a lot of safety without that joint guarantee. You can get a lot of safety just by saying, how realistic is it that uh, defaults across Europe will be so extensive that they ever get towards this senior, senior type debt? And now, you know, when you think about it, what's going to be happening, you know, in good times, the junior debt will be seen as pretty safe as well, saying, you know, no government is going to default. <coughs> Because remember, this is only up to 60% of GDP. The junior debt is within the 60% of the GDP envelope. So it might be 20% of GDP are essentially in the senior debt, the next 40% in the junior debt. So even the junior debt should be safe during normal times. And then uh, the question is, well, you know, if you start to get a bit panicky, you would run out of the junior debt into the senior debt if you're a normal uh, fund or whatever. But f from each national government point of view, that's okay, because that's just a, you know, a shuffling within this common structure. It doesn't favor Germany over Spain or Germany over Greece and so on. It's, it's all a common structure. So you can deal with fluctuations in risk tolerance without this cross-border element. Um, and, and so uh, we think that'd be, that would be a, a safer system. Um, and importantly, in terms of uh, regulation, is if banks w had regulatory incentives to hold just the ESBs, then they'd be a lot safer because essentially banks would now have this safe asset so that you know, regional problems in Spain or Italy or whatever would not imply that their banking systems would get into trouble because you've cut that loop. Because the, re the regulator would be saying, you, know, you can hold anything, but if you, if you, don't hold, if you hold anything but ESBs, you pay a penalty in, in terms of an extra capital charge. So the banks will have the incentive to hold the European safe bond, and that would make the banks a lot more stable on, in terms of that, that safe asset. Um, and so uh, you know, we, we would envisage a situation where essentially banks and others who really require a super safe asset will hold the, the senior bonds, and the junior bonds will still be you know, pretty uh, you know, low risk uh, just a tad riskier, uh, and you can imagine uh, various investment funds, hedge funds, and so on, trying to hold that. So, you know, you might say, well, you know, uh, this is just financial engineering, but that's true. But the this is a world where so much financial engineering takes place that essentially, you know, uh, in that complex world, you know, adding a bit more uh, may make sense. Uh, as I say, it, 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 uh, it re reduces the volatility in the sovereign debt market. And then the second of all, and this one of the traditional gains from a euro bond, where we think the SBs will, will get it, which is the, um, having the liquidity premium of having trade in a large-scale bond issue, which is safe. So in the same way the Treasury bill market in the US, uh, or the 10-year bond market in the US for so US government, is, is pretty liquid. Uh, here you've created a European bond uh, which will have those features. There'll be a global demand for such a European bond, and in terms of uh, earning 0.7% interest on that issue, that's something that all go participating governments 
uh, can benefit from. So, so the eurobond gain uh, from liquidity and a deeper market will be there. You might say, well, you know, if there's such an opportunity, why don't you know individual investment banks, you know, who like to create uh, uh, structures, why don't they go out and do it? Uh, well, you know, it's there's a general concept about missing financial markets. Uh, how do you get a missing market to develop? Uh, because there's a kind of um, uh, lemons type issues about why is this investment bank introducing this product? You know, what are their private incentives, uh, you know, are they, are they really going to be able to operate this? What if that bank, you know, implodes? Uh, so having a, a public agency, a European debt agency, running this system, uh, you know, would, is uh, typically seen as, as a better way to create quickly a, a large market in these things. Um, and, you know, it goes hand in hand because th th this, this thing works in terms of improving bank sector safety by, by having it as a privileged asset for open market operations, collateral operations by the ECB and so on. Uh, and again, that kind of safety dimension, that's a public good. You know, you know, as policymakers, uh, this, the stability of the financial system is something that's desirable. But any individual investment bank, that's not their job. That's not what they go around creating products for. So it, it seems to us it is a public good type operation. Now, clearly, there would be big uh, transition issues, you know, because right now banks hold all sorts of stuff, and how do you get them from here to there? Um, so, uh, you know, we, we think this is part of a package where recapitalization is necessary, so beforehand. Uh, so uh, recapitalization, uh, write down of the Greek debt, um, and then this thing can get going. But it's important to say is the level of recapitalization would be less. Because here, the value of uh, Sp Spanish debt, Irish debt, uh, Italian debt will rise. Because with this new uh, uh, player in the market, there's going to be a much more stable. Because right now, people say, well, you know, uh, if I buy Italian debt, will there be a, a um, is there anyone I can sell it to in a month's time? You know, who, who else is in this market? And often there's a fear of, you know, uh, I'm not going to, even though I think the fundamentals are fine, uh, I'm scared that everyone else will stay at home and there'll be no market in this product when I want to sell. Whereas if you announce there's going to be a major new uh, actor in the debt market, uh, that kind of uh, liquidity issue is not there. So the announcement of, of European safe bonds, the European debt agency, would mean that the value, the yields would come down on, you know, anything that's seen as just a liquid uh, but solvent. And so the level of recapitalization would be less if, if you had that um, element to it. Um, you know, the most common question we've got in the last month since we floated this idea is who's going to buy the junior tranche? Um, uh, the, the mechanics, because you might say, well, the hedge funds can you know, do a lot of diversification right now. They could buy a portfolio of European sovereign bonds. Uh, but, but all the time, uh, with individual bond purchases and so on, uh, there's all sorts of risks they face. Whereas when they have a, a large-scale uh, junior bond market here, uh, th th it's going to be a much more stable market, and it's going to be um, you know, more attractive for those hedge funds to participate. Uh, you know, so another question we get is, well, you know, uh, what, how exactly is this European debt agency going to work? Um, well, a number of key principles is it's, it's basically very little discretion. It could just be a computer, actually. Because uh, the rule is uh, the cap is 60% of GDP. And the cap is 60% of uh, a historical average of GDP. Because you don't want to get into the pro-cyclical business where a big recession means uh, a country's GDP level falls. Therefore, its debt-to-GDP ratio gets bigger. Therefore, you know, whoever needs to sell the debt to maintain a rule. So if you have an average of the last five years or 10 years of GDP, then that kind of a, um, negative cycle will be avoided. Um, and you know, to create a, a yield curve so that you know, the markets who want a good mix of short-term, medium-term, long-term debt, 
they might, their rules will say, we'll buy up to 5% of GDP of your one-year debt, up to X percent of your two-year debt, and so on. So you can build out a yield curve, uh, which will be helpful for various uh, financial planning. So this means you know, the individual countries are going to um, adjust their uh, you know, issuing practices, which is, again would be implicit in a eurobond idea. Um, and again, remember here, you know, there's no guarantees being offered. So, so the individual countries, uh, this is all in the secondary market. So the individual countries are issuing debt. There's going to be a big purchaser in the market, the, the Euro European Debt Agency. But it, you know, if your debt is above 60%, uh, which is, it is going to be for most of these countries for quite a while, no matter what. Uh, it's still the case that these countries will have to find other buyers you know, for their debt. But the point is, the marginal buyer will be different. Because right now, you know, for a country that's, say, 100% of GDP, if you like, the, the, the market yield is determined by who is that purchaser at 100%, who is the marginal purchaser. Here, you've taken out 60% of GDP because this European debt agency is buying up 60% of GDP. So the identity of who the marginal purchaser is is going to shift in. And I say most important, as I said earlier on, if you notice a big purchaser in the market, the liquidity issue is much less severe than it is now, where people are saying, who's buying European sovereign debt? Here, you, you have a, a big uh, anchor for the market. Uh, now, uh, everyone's interested in leveraging up the EFSF or the EFSF providing insurance and so on. So we agree that can be helpful. If you really want, if you want to add an extra layer of protection, is you could also have these bonds being insured. And this is where the EFSF comes in, and this is one of the proposals which apparently is, is gaining some traction. Because you can envisage saying, well, okay, you claim that these European safe bonds are extremely low risk for default. Um, but let's say, you know, I'm totally irrational, totally, you know, uh, uh, I believe in, you know, really extreme scenarios. Can, you know, I want some extra guarantee. So the EFSF can come in and say the first 10% uh, is guaranteed by the EFSF. And that insurance policy provides extra, extra um, safety. So, you know, this proposal here is coherent with the uh, insurance of bonds proposal, which uh, I think Allianz and others are, are floating at the moment. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in, in this idea, which is throughout the whole um, leveraging of the EFSF idea, which is, you know, uh, if you've got uh, uh, X amount of funding, do you really want to spend it on directly purchasing assets, or is it not enough to uh, just provide insurance uh, to assure private mm -hmm. sector purchases of, of, of uh, you know, the loss distribution. Uh, that, you know, uh, uh, you know, I think it's quite important. I mean, th there's going to be an issue that uh, the insurance has to be provided by uh, some entity or pr provided through some type of asset, which is not going to be sovereign bonds. Because right now the problem is, well, if Italy is providing EFSF funding to insure against EFSF default, you know, when you want to call upon that insurance, it's a payout going to be there. So you, you need a, a, a super safe insurer, uh, you know, uh, not me, but some of my co-authors co -author like a big pot of gold out there, but uh, uh, I won't advocate that. Um, you know, and, you know, this, this uh, uh, there are issues about, um, uh, uh, you know, how do you introduce this? We're not saying tomorrow this, this agency goes out and buys out 60% of the current stock. It could be done in stages that there's going to be particular uh, issues over the next year or two years. And so the, the debt agency initially buys up those issues. And over time, incrementally, it, it reaches the 60% of GDP limit. Um, because again, that should work. Once the market knows this, this agency is coming in, even if, it, if it's only incremental in its actual holdings, the fact that it's in the market is going to be important. So you might say, well, you know, compare this to, to euro bonds. Uh, one fundamental issue is, uh, are euro bonds realistic? And I know people will differ about you know, their view of reality and probabilities and so on. But even if you thought euro bonds were a good idea, the fact that you need treaty change 
to get real you know, euro bonds out there. So, well, you know, when is that going to happen? Whereas we think, uh, and we haven't heard even, you know, we've had this idea is being floated in a lot of different official circles. Uh, we haven't heard yet that there's any legal impediment to our idea. So it looks, it could be ready to go. Um, big problem with euro bonds is, uh, you know, what are the incentives facing national governments? You know, we're, you know, Ireland is obviously a very well behaved country which wouldn't, wouldn't uh, be subject to moral hazard, but maybe some other countries in Europe, moral hazard is a real issue. And if you have euro bonds, as I said earlier on, you know, what are the incentives to have fiscal discipline? Whereas here, every sovereign is still responsible for its debt. You know, if it defaults, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of problems for that sovereign, and no one else is bailing it out. Uh, the rest of Europe can be indifferent because their banks are safe, because their banks are only holding the European safe bonds, which would only be hit if basically nearly every country in Europe simultaneously defaults in a big way. So the rest of you know, the European banking system can you know, look on with supreme indifference uh, if a country defaults, because it's just not a big enough deal uh, to, to hit their banking systems. Um, and so you, you do want to have uh, price signals that the sovereign, individual sovereign debt markets are still active. So you know, if you see uh, your, your um, yields go up, it's not because of illiquidity. It's because you know, you're following a risky policy. And that's a signal to you know, get, you know, restore some fiscal um, <coughs> prudence. Uh, the blue bond, red bond proposal of Bruegel, um, which also is a 60% idea, um, but there they have you know, the joint guarantee on the 60%. There's a number, there's a number of problems, but the, the core of it is, is this issue of even at 60% of GDP, do you want to guarantee uh, some of the other countries in Europe? Um, you might say, well, you still face the contagion risk that if, if one country badly behaves, uh, is it not going to uh, you know, call, cause the junior bond here to, to shoot up in risk premia and so on. Um, you know, th I think that's going to be true to, to some extent. Um, but, but, you know, I think it's going to be more limited under this uh, structure than, than under the current uh, regime. So here you might say, well, you know, uh, what we've seen in Europe is, you know, policies are unpicked. In a crisis, firm promises are waved away because in the heat of the crisis, uh, politicians will be tempted to do uh, whatever is most convenient at that time. So here it's important that this European Debt Agency is strictly governed, and in particular the bonds issued by this European Debt Agency, these European uh, safe bonds, uh, are super tight in terms of uh, legal structures. Uh, so you, you need, you know, so basically you write the law saying if we ever, you know, uh, change the rules here to expand the amount of debt the European Debt Agency buys or to disproportionately buy the debt of risky countries and so on, you know, you, know, you, can, take, you can take a lot from us. So you need to have a, a setup where existing bondholders will be a big lobby group, that they there will be no way for um, a national, uh, for the European Debt Agency to, in a crisis, be tempted to start buying uh, uh, outside of its rule structure. So, you know, we, we realize this is essentially a CDO. Um, and, you know, there is a level of uh, uh, irony about the fact that, you know, uh, the kind of securitization business was responsible for a lot of problems in this financial crisis. But I think the reality is, you know, an awful lot of what you see is essentially recognizing this is the way the modern financial system works. Um, and, you know, all the stuff about leveraging the EFSF Structured NAMA here, for that matter. There's all sorts of things which are essentially uh, structured financial vehicles, um, and essentially, uh, you know, you can uh, use all sorts of little, uh, you know, uh, uh, responses to that. Um, but but uh, this is a bit different because publicly issued uh, um, collateralized debt and um, uh, structured debt in the sense of junior versus senior debt is, is very different. Uh, in terms of incentive schemes versus um, a private operator. Because remember, the private operators, the problem was what they were calling AAA, the senior stuff, in fact, was not all that safe. So when you, you know, the real problem was it turned out you had these AAA mortgage-backed securities where a lot of the mortgages in that, you know, apparently safe element were not that safe. 
Whereas here, we think it's, it's a lot easier to analyze you know, the correlation structure across 17 sovereigns in Europe than it is across thousands and hundreds of thousands of mortgages. Uh, in terms of incentives, there'd be a lot more transparency. There's not that many underlying bonds here to, to analyze, to think about um, uh, whether this thing is going to be safe or not. And you know, we've run a lot of, we have a, on the website, euronomics.com, there's a, a quite a long uh, document. And we go through a lot of correlation analysis about under what scenarios would these uh, European safe bonds ever get hit by default. And you know, it's non-zero, but it's pretty low, close to zero probability. Um, <coughs> and again, if you use EFSF to provide further insurance, that probability gets even tinier, even closer towards zero. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, these things can be phased in. Uh, the, the Basel or requirements or the ECB pol collateral policies can be, you know, adjusted over time. Uh, you can in conceive of um, as swap uh, policies so that banks currently holding, uh, you know, a <coughs> range of sovereign debt uh, issues could swap them into ESBs. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, with bank recapitalization, uh, it, you know, the fact that this data agency will stabilize sovereign prices will mean um, that, that the scale of recapitalization is going to be smaller. Now, we think, uh, in general, uh, not just vis-a-vis -vis SVs, that the recap is probably going to be mandated, because if you do it on an individual country-by-country -country basis, the incentives to, to deny you need it are so strong um, to avoid stigma issues. Um, you know, a kind of coordinated recapitalization is probably going to be important. Uh, you know, you might say, well, you know, I'm not buying anything right now because if you include Greek debt and what you're going to use to build these SBs, I'm not interested. So, yeah, we, we think uh, this will work a lot better after the large scale Greek restructuring, which seems to be uh, uh, coming down the tracks. Um, and you can do it in advance with this, you know, differential pricing to Greek debt also. Uh, so I'm then just to, to finish up here. You know, we, this is not saying this is you know there's not a silver bullet to to solve this multi-dimensional uh, European banking crisis, but this could be one element. Um, and as I said earlier on, uh, it does definitely needs the European Bank Resolution Scheme, uh, a way to shut down uh, failing banks, all of that stuff. This is really just directed at stabilizing the sovereign debt market, because you know I think our view would be. Uh, th you know, lots of countries have debt levels that are too high, but the market is, is dysfunctional at the moment. The, the uh, run for the exit problem is it's a natural response, but collectively it's damaging. So having a safe bond, which is essentially uh, where the benefits are common across Europe, rather than just accruing to Germany and the other super safe countries, we think would be a better system. Um, it is an open question whether Germany would vote for it, but uh, at a collective level, we think it would be a better idea. So, um, you know, in terms of conclusions is, remember, what, what is the issue here? The issue really is how to make banks safer, uh, in the sense of, you know, breaking the link between uh, bank positions and sovereign debt positions. Uh, while at the same time, the euro bond idea suffers from, you know, the moral hazard problem of you know, national governments being, uh, having less incentive to, to behave fiscally. Uh, we think this is going to fix the liquidity panic problem where if you don't like uh, Spanish risk, you run out of Spain towards Germany. Here, you run from the junior debt to the senior debt. Uh, we think you know, this can be well designed, lagged GDP, um, and you know, very tight rules about uh, not, not changing the, uh, the uh, purchase policy of the European Debt Agency. And, you know, we, uh, you know uh, and then there's a, collective, there's a collective gain, which is if there is a bigger, more deeper uh, bond market for these ESBs, uh, the average interest rate is going to be lower than what is currently paid. And that creates real resources uh, for governments uh, everywhere. And so that, that is where the collective interest is, is in setting this up. So let me uh, stop there and take questions or comments. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.